Chapter 10 of The Girls of Friendly Terrace by Harriet Loomis Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10 Ruth is Perplexed. Peggy was in her room, combing her hair, when Ruth came in. At the sound of her voice in the hall, Peggy pushed the door ajar and hailed her cheerily. Hello there, come on upstairs. I'm trying to do my hair Anna's way, and I'm having such a time. She had turned back to the mirror and was struggling with the rebellious locks when Ruth burst into the room, somewhat out of breath, after her hasty ascent of the stairs. Oh, Peggy, she panted, the awfulest thing. What happened? Peggy demanded briskly. She knew Ruth well enough to be aware that the awfulest thing might mean that her father was bankrupt or that she had mislaid her thimble. People who habitually indulge in superlatives must not complain over belated sympathy. Just read this. Ruth checked herself suddenly. It's something, she said in an altered voice, that it would be better for a small person's not to overhear. Peggy turned hastily. Dorothy stood in the doorway, her resentful gaze fastened upon Ruth. Dorothy was extremely sensitive regarding any reference to her tender years, and seldom failed to grasp the import of a carefully veiled allusion to her presence, even though the words used were beyond her understanding. There aren't any small persons over here, she announced, scowling darkly in Ruth's direction. There's nobody here but three big girls. Peggy discreetly dropped her hair over her face to veil a smile. I wonder what Taffy is doing, she said diplomatically. I hope he isn't out on the front lawn where he'll get into a quarrel with the butcher's dog. Dorothy looked stubbornly at the toes of her small shoes, and Peggy tried another tack. Let's see. I wonder if I left any caramels on the plate in the pantry last night. Yes, I believe there were two or three. Maybe Dick ate them, suggested Dorothy, falling into the snare. He hadn't eaten them fifteen minutes ago when I came upstairs. On the plate with the blue castle, Dorothy, dear. And Sally will hand it down to you if you can't reach it. Peggy laughed out as Dorothy clattered down the stairs. Isn't she quick? She exclaimed admiringly. That child knew in a second you wanted to get rid of her. She shook her hair back as she spoke, and for the first time she caught sight of Ruth's face. Why, Ruth? Peggy took an impulsive step forward. Then it's really... It's something really dreadful, Ruth returned, biting the lip which would tremble in spite of her efforts. She turned the key in the lock to secure the conference against further interruptions and held a letter toward Peggy. Read that, she said. The sheet Peggy drew from the square envelope bore a showy monogram at the top. My dear boy, Peggy read, and then looked up bewildered. Why, I don't see. Oh, go on. Ruth cried with an impatient stamp of her foot. Do go on. And Peggy obediently read the communication aloud. My dear boy, the charming little pendant came last evening, and I thank you a thousand times. The design is as unique and charming as that of the brooch you sent last week. I noticed that you purchased both at King and Kennedy's, who are noted, I understand, for exclusive designs, as well as for the superior quality of their goods. By the way, I noticed a darling little ring, a combination of pearls and sapphires, in their window the other day. Ask to see it sometime when you are passing. They are most obliging and always ready to show their stock whether you wish to purchase or not. Again, with many thanks, yours, Maud. Peggy's blank stare met her friend's disturbed gaze. I don't understand it, she cried. Who wrote it? And whom is it written to? And why did you bring it to me? And what makes you act as if it was so dreadful? Because it is dreadful. Ruth's voice was unnaturally hard. I don't know who wrote it, except that her name is Maud. But the letter is written to Graham. Peggy glanced quickly at the envelope in her hand, and then let it fall to the floor as if it had scorched her fingers. Oh, Ruth, she exclaimed reproachfully. Why did you tell me to read it? Peggy, hush. This isn't a time for quibbling. You've got to help me and tell me what to do. The tears of utter misery began suddenly to course down Ruth's cheeks, and Peggy hastily assumed the role of comforter. Oh, Ruth, you mustn't feel that way about it. Of course, you and Graham have always been great chums, but you must have known that someday there'd be somebody he, he'd care for more than for you. Peggy Raymond, I never thought you could be so stupid. Ruth's voice told of exasperation. Listen, this letter is written by a girl named Maud, 
and Graham never mentioned such a person to any of us. He has lots of girlfriends, like all college boys, and their pictures are all around his room, and I know the names of every single one, but he never has said a word about Maud. Peggy shook her head helplessly, unable to suggest any satisfactory explanation for Graham's singular omission. Ruth continued, gradually losing her self-control, as she summed up the evidence against the brother she adored. That would be queer, Peggy, and it would make me feel dreadfully hurt. But, of course, Graham isn't obliged to tell me about his friends unless he chooses to. That isn't the worst part. You see, he's giving her presents, things that cost a lot. It was a pendant this week, and a brooch last, and now she's hinting for a ring. Yes, he must think a great deal of her, Peggy acknowledged gravely. But Graham hasn't any money of his own. Father's doing it all. And the worst of it is that Graham's expenses are so heavy this year that Father is having a real hard time. He spoke to Graham about it not a week ago and asked him to be as careful as he could. And Graham talked so beautifully about it and he wanted to give up lots of things and Father said no and that he'd get hold of the money somehow. And after all that, Graham has bought jewelry for this Maud. Peggy made no effort to check her friend's wild outburst of weeping. Under the circumstances, it would do Ruth good to cry. She looked with a sense of shrinking disgust at the letter on the floor, as if it had been some sort of loathsome creature. How could he, she said to herself, as Graham's frank, handsome face flashed out on the screen of her memory. Only that morning, she had seen Graham and his father pass. The older man was listening to something the younger was saying, smiling a little, and the look he bent upon his son was full of trust and confidence. And all the time Graham had been deceiving him, taking the money which meant sacrifices in the home to buy costly presents for a girl whose name he had never mentioned to his sister. It was no wonder that Ruth cried. Sunny Peggy felt sick and disillusioned. The doorknob rattled. It's me, said a voice which sounded very much as if the three caramels were simultaneously occupying one small mouth. Run along, Dorothy. Peggy was too absorbed in the problem confronting her to make her request tactful. She went over to Ruth, who was making a brave struggle to regain her self-control, and possessing herself of the limp hand, stroked it tenderly. Then Peggy's instinct to make excuses for everybody led her to say, After all, perhaps we're making a mountain out of a molehill. Molehill? exclaimed Ruth indignantly. How can you call it a molehill for Graham to take his father's money and pretend it's for things at college when all the time... Yes, I know. But there's a chance of a mistake, Peggy protested. I don't suppose you've talked with Graham about it. Goodness, no. I went up to his room this morning to do the work, and this letter lay on the floor, not even in the envelope. That doesn't look as if he were ashamed of it, Peggy exclaimed triumphantly. Oh, that's Graham all over. No matter what he did, he'd be too careless to cover his tracks. I picked it up and looked at it to see if it was meant to be thrown away or not. And then my eye caught that about the pendant, and I simply couldn't stop. And after I saw what it meant, it seemed to me that I should die if I didn't tell somebody. But Ruth, Peggy protested, alarmed, you surely are going to talk to Graham about it. You can't mean to let it go on and not give him a chance to explain or anything. Poor Ruth hid her face in her hands. Oh, Peggy, she cried in a stifled voice. If I thought he could explain, I'd be only too glad to give him a chance. But you know yourself he can't. And how can I bear to tell him that I know all about it? If it was anything else, I wouldn't feel so... She added despairingly. But think, Peggy, of telling your brother that you know he has been cheating your father. And being mean and underhanded all the time that he talked so beautifully about how grateful he was for what he had done for him and how hard he was going to try to make us all proud of him. It was a black picture. Then I suppose, said Peggy after a long pause, that you'll tell your father. Father? Ruth spoke the word with a little protesting cry. Why, it would kill father to know such a thing about Graham. He never could bear it. Peggy hesitated. Strong as her sympathy was for Ruth, her sturdy common sense refused to take her friend's view of the case. Ruth, this is too serious a thing for two girls like us to keep to ourselves. Somebody's got to know. Somebody who'll understand what to do. Ruth sprang to her feet. You don't mean that you'll tell. Peggy, you couldn't be so, 
so dishonorable as to tell. I came to you because I had to confide in somebody. And now, if I can't trust you... Oh, good gracious, exclaimed Peggy with an irritation of which she was immediately ashamed. Of course I'm not going to tell, but you are. Ruth, you must. Again and again they went over the ground, Peggy coaxing, persuading, trying vainly to bring her friend's resolution to the sticking point, while Ruth squirmed and evaded and protested and even accused Peggy of heartlessness. I tell you, it would kill father. He's wrapped up in Graham. If he found out that he had tricked and cheated him, he'd never have another happy minute. Your mother, then. Mother? Why, that would be worse. If anything could be worse. Her heart isn't strong, you know. The doctor says we must be careful about shocks. Then, Ruth Wiley, there's no two ways about it. You've got to pluck up your courage and have it out with Graham. It was in the discussion of this point that Peggy was accused of heartlessness, a most unjust charge, for at the moment her heart was aching for poor Ruth and her misery. You don't understand, Ruth insisted. You can't understand. Your brother is younger than you are, but if he were older and you'd always looked up to him and thought he was perfectly splendid and felt sorry for other girls with ordinary brothers, just think what it would be like to face him and tell him that you'd found him out and that he was mean and contemptible. Oh, it don't seem as if I could be talking about Graham. Oh, Peggy, why did I ever read that letter? Peggy temporarily gave up the effort to bring Ruth to a realizing sense of her responsibility in the matter and set herself to soothe her. Between indignation on her father's account and grief over the discovery of the glaring weakness in her brother, whom she had been accustomed to set on a pedestal, poor Ruth's nerves were sadly unstrung. Peggy coaxed her to lie down upon the bed and stroked her burning forehead with sympathetic fingers, cooing over her like a dove over its nestlings. All that was sweet and womanly in Peggy responded to the challenge of suffering, and her fingers had the deft tenderness which characterizes the born nurse and is not always secured by a course of training in the hospitals. She was just congratulating herself that Ruth's tense muscles were relaxing somewhat and that her breathing was less hurried and irregular when a crash in the hall followed by staccato scream sent her flying to the door. Most unexpectedly, she found her exit barred by a solid oak table, and, when she pushed that impatiently aside, she stumbled over the upturned rockers of Dorothy's little chair. Dorothy herself was somewhere on the stairs, screaming lustily, while Mrs. Raymond and Sally were bending over her, imploring her to tell them where she was hurt. "'What is it? What has happened?' shrieked Peggy, plunging down the stairs, forgetful of everything except the possibility that Dorothy was seriously injured. No one had time to explain, but gradually from scraps of information let fall, aided by her own intuition, Peggy reached an understanding of the catastrophe. Dorothy, aggrieved by the turning of the key in the lock, had pushed a table in front of Peggy's door and placed her own small rocking chair on top, intending from this vantage ground to make a dramatic entrance through the transom. The rocking chair had frustrated this maneuver by swaying at the wrong moment, and Dorothy had plunged over the banisters while the chair had toppled to the floor with a crash worthy a more imposing piece of furniture. "'Can you move your arms and legs, dear? Let Grandma see you kick,' pleaded Mrs. Raymond, running her fingers anxiously over Dorothy's plump little body in search of broken bones. "'It's her insides that are hurt most like. My ma had a cousin who got his insides hurt in a fall, and for seventeen years he never left his bed.' Sally, who had a taste for the ghastly, contributed this information, and would have gone on to give the harrowing details had she not perceived that no one was paying any attention to her. Dorothy's screams were gradually subsiding into gasping sobs. She turned her pathetic, tear-stained little face toward Peggy, who crouched on the stairs beside her, a conscience-stricken heap, repeating miserably, "'Oh, Dorothy, where does it hurt, darling?' "'I... I swallowed him. Dorothy volunteered at last, and burst into fresh lamentations. Swallowed what, dear? The caramels. I swallowed them quick. I didn't have time to eat them. Peggy and her mother exchanged wide-eyed glances. Don't mind about that, dear, coaxed Peggy. By and by, when you feel better, I'll make you some more candy. Dorothy's sobs ceased with an abruptness that was uncanny. Feel better now, she said. But where does it hurt, Dorothy? Don't hurt, but I like butterscotch better than caramels. You shall have butterscotch, you precious. But where? 
Peggy's solicitous inquiries were interrupted by Dorothy's clapping her hands and beginning to frisk about in a manner which set at ease conclusively any fear as to broken bones. It struck into her brains most like, said Sally hopefully. I knowed an idiot boy once. It was a fall striking into his brains that ailed him. Mrs. Raymond and Peggy were too accustomed to Sally's doleful prophecies to be cast down. They heaved sighs of relief, exchanged smiles, and Peggy flew to her room to get her apron. At the head of the stairs, she encountered Ruth, a red-eyed, drooping figure, and Peggy's conscience reproached her that in her own alarm and relief, she had momentarily forgotten her friend's greater cause for anxiety. "'You see,' she whispered, pausing for a moment, "'sometimes things turn out better than you think they will. I was almost sure that Dorothy was dreadfully hurt, you know.' But Ruth only shook her head and made the answer characteristic of people in trouble who were all likely to think their own especial load, unlike any other burden. But this is different. End of chapter 10